Good afternoon. It's, um, it's a great honor and, and really fun to be here uh, as I uh, share with Jim two passions, the passion for the produce business and also a passion and love for Puerto Rico. So it's fun for me. I, I, this is my old college town as I went to school at Fordham University up in the Bronx. And it's fun to be back and talking about uh, something that really moved me during my college years, which is how do we grow uh, the island's economy and make a better, uh, better uh, livelihood for the people there. So I'll share with you an overview of our company's history briefly, only to highlight some of the backdrop elements that Jim already highlighted, because I believe it's in that legacy of elements, even in things that look very negative, that are exactly the ingredients that we will use for a very interesting uh, move forward in which the, uh, the, the fresh uh, uh, produce business and the, and the ag business has a great contribution to make once again to the island's economy. So let's get started. Our, our business, Caribbean Produce, was started by my grandfather, uh, who's in the middle of the left-hand picture with the brown jacket. And we're celebrating the 25th anniversary. Flanked sons in the in the light colored suit. It's uh, my father, Gualberto Tito, known as Tito Rodriguez, and my uncle Luis. So my grandfather, who grew up in a in a coffee plantation in a successful coffee coffee plantation in the 20s and 30s, uh, left at 15, butting heads with his strong-handed, strong-fisted father. And he actually was uh, uh, even homeless for about a week, sleeping under bridges in San Juan, until his uncle and aunt picked him up and uh, falsified his birth records uh, for the US Army so he could enlist and serve in World War II. When he came back unscathed, uh, he uh, went and pursued his passion for ag. He, was, he had a wonderment for nature and how things uh, could grow up in the mountains. So he pursued his degree in uh, agricultural science. And uh, later on, uh, as he pursued a career in the public sector, in the Department of Ag, he was actually uh, uh, received a scholarship that allowed him to go to, with his wife and my father, who was about three years old at the time, to Ohio State for a master's in agricultural marketing in 1953. Huge advantage, and that's going to prove uh, that's going to be relevant to the story that I'm going to share with you. As he had a foresight, much of what we're trying to do here today, had foresight into the development of the supermarket retail model that was developing in the post-war era, in which the buyer was not the same person that was paying for the product, was not the same person that was receiving the product, and was not the same person that was putting the product at the point of sale. So my grandfather essentially developed a company uh, at age 36 that responded to that new business model in which uh, essentially standardization was fundamental, in which a case had to have an exact amount of weight, an exact count. Uh, the product inside the case had to have a speck of length and girth uh, uh, so you, you could have efficient transactions in a market that was moving from the very traditional terminal markets in which a buyer could inspect the product and negotiate. So that was fundamental. Education and foresight were, are fundamental in our, in our, in our family's history. In, in uh, 79 to 2002, the second generation uh, ran the business. Then in 2002, I joined the business and um, uh, I've been ahead of it since 2005, for 10, 10 and a half years. That's my grandfather in his last few years. He, uh, like I said, was empowered by that education. And you'll see how part of what Puerto Rico has to offer is a very interesting technical, professional, and, and commercial uh, expertise as we have been serving companies that are very sophisticated in the world of food. Our company these days is a $90 million a year company. Uh, uh, we've been around for 55 years. We're very proud that for 31 consecutive years, we've achieved the trading member status of the Blue Book. Turns out we're the only company outside of uh, North America, outside of US and Canada, with such a record. So it, it, it really is something that we manage our company with that in mind, and it affects our processes and, and, and quality control and receiving and sales and purchasing. 
These are some of our trading partners. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see some of the, our, our customers, uh, the likes of Walmart and Subway, two of the largest operators in the world in their respective categories. Uh, also, we're part of the supply chain of Costco, of Sam's, of Burger King, and some of the cruise ship companies like Carnival. And on the right side, we're proud to partner up with companies that you know, uh, some of which uh, from the US and Canada, Dole from around the world. We do a lot of business with them out of South America as well. Driscoll's, Gorgiulio, who's owned by Procacci Brothers, and we'll talk more about them and how they have been taking advantage of what Puerto Rico has to offer for more than 30 years now. And uh, net ex local exporters like Martex Farms in the mango category. We are passionate about getting the best people who can get the produce bug, uh, which is which is a, a, a not always an easy thing to achieve in, a, in, a, in an island market. But once again, our economic history has given us exposure to very sophisticated business systems such as Walmart's, Kellogg's, Frito-Lay. So these are all institutions from which uh, people inside our company and the leadership roles uh, have worked in or have trained at educationally as well. Um, uh, I was very excited to see uh, Dr. Roberta Cook here this morning from UC Davis. She's about five or six of our uh, management managers have gone through, including myself, have gone through uh, trainings with her at UC Davis uh, and all over different institutions that we've hired to essentially do what was the edge for my grandfather, which is keep being the most professional team in the business for the region. And the challenges that we've heard today um, and that we keep trying to embrace are certainly asking that uh, we bring our, our very best game and our very best people that we can bring into the business. So that's been key to being around for three generations. The joke is I am the fourth president of the company. So the only reason you can do that is to have amazing staff underneath. So in spite of the family, you continue to have a, a successful uh, uh, company. So we're very proud of our professional team. Our company's purpose, as we declare it, is that together we create inspiring experiences for consumers. When we turned 50, we uh, did a, a project that was very sociological. Instead of defining for our employees what the values were, we asked them through anecdotes to tell us what were the living values in the company, and these six were the ones that uh, came up. And their commitment, innovation, responsibility, integrity, service, and teamwork. We use this, we truly use this to guide, especially as we go through a lot of changes in the last few years. It's the one way to stay true to the part of the formula that ought not to change without some serious uh, uh, debate. So we are pretty free on the innovation side. We're pretty constrained on the value side. So the result of that purpose is this is the kind of work we're doing on the island. This actually is a, you recognize by the signage, it's a Walmart store uh, of the chain that they bought in 2002 called Amigo. Walmart has actually been innovating quite a bit in the produce category, uh, taking some of the programs that we've uh, developed jointly with them and uh, combine some insights, consumer insights that we've received from the FMI of consumer insights on on what drives, what drives uh, some of these uh, uh, impulse sales in, in produce and leverage the, the colors scientifically to drive sales in stores. And they've combined that with their own uh, nutrition program that they had developed with colors as well a couple of years before. And some independent operators too, they have uh, adopted these with great results, some of them have uh, seen lifts in sales of uh, low double digits with the same store in a declining market. They have actually increased double digit increase in sales and profitability by working to optimize their produce sections. And we've taken this game also to the food service side. We created new uh, uh, pieces of furniture that actually make, make for floor space uh, and optimize this stuff we're bringing from the snack industry, from some of our colleagues that have coming from Mars, Kellogg's, Frito-Lay. They use points of interruption, and we try to adopt those techniques 
using local suppliers that, uh, to create these these tools that increase space, also in convenience stores as well, where some of these snack companies are particularly masterful at uh, getting more dollars out of that visit at the convenience store level. So we're playing a lot in the last two and a half years with consumer marketing and trying to come up with our own ways of uh, creating lift in a declining market, and, and it, it is working. So the story behind the, the, uh, this tracks from 1947 to 2009, uh, that's the contribution of agriculture to the gross national product of Puerto Rico. So when my grandfather was coming back from the army, the agriculture was at 20% of the gross national product. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, so in literally in the year, a uh, hundred years ago from today, the contributions was close to 70%. Puerto Rico at some point had a, an important share of the sugar market globally, as well as it was an important player in coffee and in tobacco. So what, what happened? And, and what's good about this? Here's another important thing. We essentially abandoned agriculture in the mid 40s when we pursued a economic development strategy that had very positive results uh, by pursuing manufacturing. We started with textiles, then moved to electronic equipment and pharma. As a result, uh, three quarters of the available farmland in Puerto Rico is actually not being used for agriculture. It's actually not being used. Turns out Puerto Rico has the second highest rate of reforestation in the world. Because we haven't been exploiting our natural resources, nature has taken over. So this is what happened in, our, in, a, in a snapshot in our economic development model. We uh, essentially, uh, this is the, the, the amount of people employed, went from 225,000 people employed in agriculture in the 1940s. And it's now, uh, actually, this is 1990. If you go to the figure now, it's less than 20,000 people employed in agriculture. At the same time, the manufacturing strategy worked, and manufacturing rose. And a lot of the problems that we have in government, too, have to do because government work also rose and service, so financial industry and commerce in general. Our island right now is host to the top names in uh, uh, biotech and life sciences, as well as electronic manufacturing. So you'll recognize a lot of the names uh, there are, have been present on the island since the 60s, 70s, and beyond. They still have significant investment, and it is still the largest part of our economic contribution with something around 46% of our uh, GNP. And on the commercial side, we were talking before Dr. Cook was saying, as we kind of urbanize, people stop growing their food, then become buyers of food. This is a, a, a little potpourri of some of the brands and the companies that you'll recognize from the US that are present on the island, which what has given us as, a, as, a, as, a, as an industry is a, an exposition and an adaptation to the high standards of food safety, packaging, commercial delivery, service, quality that these supply chains require of suppliers. And that is also a, an asset, just that know-how of what, is it, what does it take to sell Costco? What does it tell to be a supply chain partner to Subway? What does Walmart require to approve a new product or to approve a new vendor? Understanding that and being familiar with that and going through all the third-party audits on food safety every year, uh, social audits, and just being sharp on those and getting the 96 and the 98 percent on those audits make you very fit for many other opportunities that I'll talk to you about now. Another result of our economic model, economic development model, is that we import 85 percent of the foods and beverages that we consume on the island. 85 percent. That amounts at wholesale prices to $3.5 billion. So that 15% that is local could be 40%. So it could be close to three times that we have the capacity from a land perspective to, to do so. 
has a great opportunity and it's a bit of a, a sense of pendulum that I have about uh, an economy that shifted quickly to manufacturing and essentially abandoned all, the, all these assets, but it has not done anything with them. So we have land that has not, we have farmland that has not been farmed in 70 years. And there's a world and there's a North America looking for organic farmland. We're sitting on a ton of organic, potentially organic farmland where nothing has happened for 70 years. When I see the map of the world as far as the percentage of GDP that, uh, uh, that agriculture contributes around the world, the darker colors are the high numbers, close to the upwards of 15, 20, 30 percent of the contribution to the economy that uh, agriculture represents. And the light colors are those below 2%. So I see, if, if you uh, are familiar with the map, just Puerto Rico right there east of the Dominican Republic, uh, uh, in the middle, in the eastern extreme of the Caribbean, is actually in that 1% level. So for me, it's almost an issue of physics. You know, if, if the world has this pressure to produce, and we've heard this morning, especially the US with the, the need to produce more food to sustain what's happening in the world and its, and its own consumption, then you have this little piece of land that is like finding a hundred dollar bill in a pair of jeans that you had in the dryer. It's, it's not a 20, it's about a hundred. It, it changes your evening at least. You can do something tonight. Uh, it's not just another 20 that's gonna get used and you don't know what happened. It's, it's, it's something you can do with it. And it's right there, it's part of the US system that enjoys all the same securities and, and, and safeties, and it has an interesting connectivity as well that we'll, we'll talk about. This, this graph, it's, 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 if, you, if you look at the, the uh, vertical axis on the left, Puerto Rico is actually on the, the top point on the left side, very close to the lower axis of zero, which means those that we have a high percentage of contribution of manufacturing to our economy, but a very low percentage in agriculture. And once again, it's just kind of, uh, Jim had a great quote before um, about when things just shouldn't go on the same, they just won't. We are so far off on the outlier of not producing food that we consume. Don't even think of the food that is needed in the immediate region where we are, when we have all these great natural conditions to grow food, that it just can't stay like that. It, it, it's just the physics of it. it won't allow that hundred dollar bill to go unused. That's my theory. So let's take a look at what we have too: the climate and water. Right. This is this is a snapshot of June of this year, of the monitor of the drought by uh, NOAA, and you see where California was, and we spoke about it a little bit this morning. Dr. Cook mentioned it, and I was asked, and Puerto Rico is in that uh, right uh, rectangle on the bottom. Just cruising well within that drought period, okay? We have about in inches, our low average is in the 80 something inches of annual rainfall a year, going up into the hundreds. We have water, we have plenty of water. There's water falling for free on our island. That's an important asset for choosing where to locate production these days. People. This is a picture of a, a young PhD in uh, agricultural science. She's one of three uh, PhDs that just happened to have moved back to the island uh, after finishing their degrees in the University of Idaho. And as such, the interesting part is that the University of Puerto Rico is the only tropical land grant university in the US. There is no other university a land grant university in the US that is tropical. You know, land grant universities are obligated to support with research the needs of industry. So you can set up projects to solve agricultural issues and access federal support in a unique setting in which you have the US legal framework, the protection of intellectual property, the same rules of law that you know and understand, same banking system, and just go at these global problems in a, in a very unique pocket where you can do so. But of course, other smart people have figured this out and have been doing this for a while. I'll tell you more about that in a second. Connectivity, logistics, 
This is a, a, a map of the connectivity of uh, Puerto Rico with just the eastern seaboard. And it turns out Puerto Rico's ocean trade represents 18% of all the ocean uh, domestic uh, movements uh, within the US. So it's a pretty intense trade. And as uh, Jim mentioned, that he took advantage of the northbound empty reefers, we still have that issue. When you're importing 85% of your food and beverages, four out of five refrigerated containers are going back empty, which is a phenomenal opportunity, again, to fill them up with foods that could basically disrupt the trucking system of, that's connecting right now, for example, California with New York. It's, you, we could get to the, the southeast region of the US faster than you could truck stuff from California and cheaper. That's a very interesting uh, structural advantage that doesn't seem to be getting any better for California or for the trucking industry. We know what Caribbean produce. We ship, for example, leafy greens 52 weeks of the year from the West Coast. So we know when rates go up to $10,000 for trucking only. And we know what happens when we're switching uh, regions in the West. We understand that. As one of my uh, coaches likes to say, the gift is in the pain, right? So the, that, that pain, these are supply chains, as we discussed this morning, our historical supply chains, we, because of what's happening in weather change and with population growth, are not gonna stay the same. It's an issue of whether we're gonna get ahead of them and redesign and have the vision to redesign new supply chains, or we're gonna find those supply chains not be able to deliver to consumers and to the trade the results that uh, financially we all need. Connectivity with Europe, uh, we actually can be in Rotterdam every week in nine days. So once again, it, takes, it actually takes us as a company, Caribbean Produce, nine days to bring a head of romaine lettuce from Salinas to our receiving dock. So it actually takes mango exporters in Puerto Rico nine days to be in Rotterdam. So it's a very interesting uh, place in the world, and it's every week they have a stable, dedicated service for that. So I believe agriculture can actually step in once again and, and uh, contribute to our economic development, and if both in terms of uh, dollars, research, jobs. There's some estimates that if we hit that 40% of local production uh, of what we consume, uh, we could actually increase from the about 20,000 jobs we have now to about 85,000 jobs. And it's upwards just in the wholesale prices of the product. It's upwards of $1.3 billion. But that's not counting what would happen to the cardboard producers, the plastic producers, transportation, all the inputs that we know that agriculture uh, uh, produces in, in when it gets going. This is, this is a front page news of our business journal on the island last year. So there's an increasing uh, awareness of the opportunity at, in the business sector. Just there are very few people that understand the trade like we do, I mean by like we do over here, and who can actually take action on these opportunities, which is I'm delighted to be here and share with you. I wanna bring some of you to take action in Puerto Rico. This is our current Secretary of Agriculture Dr. Mina Comas, turns out her thesis before being uh, Secretary of Ag was about the vulnerability of the supply chains of perishables into the island in the face of climate change. So she understands profoundly what the opportunity is from a policy standpoint. And the government has actually shifted around and after betting on manufacturing for all these decades has understood <clears throat> that there's a bet to be placed fundamental to our, to our uh, not only economic but social development, that we connect consumers with the food that we can produce. And that's another uh, piece by uh, uh, that alignment to that. I just, when I was here sitting this morning, I got confirmation that the Department of Ag is actually supporting a study that we're proposing to uh, identify in four months the investment areas in which uh, there are opportunities so that investors from outside of the island know exactly where the opportunities lie. Because this is not just in produce. This is good for dairy, for cattle, for poultry, for fishing. So plenty of opportunities that have been simply 
not focused on, and it's the, the, the time is here, the time is now. I'll give you uh, a couple of examples of companies that you might know that are taking advantage and have been taking advantage of Puerto Rico's uh, assets. Uh, Gargiulia Farms in Puerto Rico is part of the uh, Gargiulia company. They have about four or five production areas in the U.S. This is one of them. They only uh, use it or they only, uh, uh, sorry, they harvest tomatoes uh, from January to late April. Uh, they, they have an output of about 37.5 million cases, uh, and, uh, sorry, 37.5 million pounds, and they, 70% of that output goes into the eastern seaboard during the months of January to April, and the other 30% almost captures 100% of our local market. What's interesting about this issue is that Gargiulio, since 1983, uh, actually building on some of the work that was done by Israeli companies before that in the melon category that, that Jim mentioned. Since 1983, have been doing what is essentially a weather hedge. And the weather hedge, which I think is very insightful for all of us that have to uh, adjust to the evident climate change, their weather hedge is that they know that every three to four years, these cold fronts come through South Florida and they wreak havoc on the uh, pricing of tomatoes, and they have the only U.S. grown tomato when that happens on the eastern seaboard. And they make great profits when that happens. And every year, they have a consistent supply. What's great about this story, too, is that the uh, tomato from Puerto Rico, even though it's not marketed intentionally as from Puerto Rico, those in the know uh, actually ask for it when they have an option, because in that time period, it does produce a very high quality uh, tomato that is preferred. And we can attest to that. We have a repack operation, and our, our yields are uh, much better when we have the local uh, crop. Of course, we have fresh, fresh product, uh, but it does perform very well down, downstream. The last two years, we have developed as a company, Caribbean Produce has developed a marketing campaign that's been award-winning. Uh, a marketing campaign that supports the local consumption of tomatoes, something that even though the story was there for 30 years, people didn't know that from January to April, all the tomatoes they were consuming uh, came from Puerto Rico. And uh, Subway, for example, uh, was very supportive of this. Church's Fried Chicken put it in, the, uh, in their uh, commercials in the movie theaters. Uh, there were billboards. Uh, one of the campaigns was taken off the I love New York sign, like so I love the tomatoes from Puerto Rico. The other one had to do with the mother of all tomatoes. We have in our Facebook page, uh, I think we're upwards of 64,000 uh, likes by now after two years, and it's become a great uh, tool for engaging consumers very economically and driving that passion and a preference for the local crop. Martex Farms is an exporter of mangoes also since the uh, 80s. It's a local family, and their markets, or strong markets, are Europe and the eastern seaboard of the U.S. And they have uh, managed, through using uh, techniques from Israel, and their chief agronomist is actually an Israeli doctor, they have managed to manipulate their crops so that they can have year-round availability. And they do an excellent job too, we're very proud of them, and they're also about 60% of their crop is exported. The rest is uh, uh, locally, and they are part of the Costco supply chain, for example, and Walmart as well. The ag biotech companies have also been taking advantage of the fact that in Puerto Rico they can have three to four crops a year for the development of uh, seeds and different techniques. So they've been also taking advantage of the climate, the weather, but also the U.S. legal framework, because all the R&D development that happens there is protected uh, by the U.S. framework, by the legal framework, because we, we're part of the same uh, legal system. John Paulson, who some of you from, from the area in the investment world uh, here definitely know, he's a, a, a famous hedge fund trader, uh, hedge fund manager. He um, He's recently brought some of his companies and a lot of his uh, investments in the last two, three years into the island. 
because uh, he feels very safe with the, with the legal system there. But he also feels very good about some of the tax incentives that Puerto Rico is offering these days. Uh, very, very generous incentives with agriculture, but also for exporting services. We're talking about being inside of the U.S. system and only paying 4% on, your ta on taxes on, the, on that income of companies that are exporting. And exporting, by Puerto Rico definition, means selling outside of Puerto Rico. So you could be selling right back into your home markets here and instead of paying 39%, uh, paying 4%. And for those of you who have uh, companies with, uh, uh, with, with shareholders are willing to move with a simple residency, if you basically sleep one more night than half of a year in Puerto Rico, you can also pay 0% on dividends of those same companies. So that's the kind of thing that also makes uh, Mr. Paulson uh, feel very comfortable with the framework uh, in Puerto Rico. Lots of incentives for R&D. Lots of incentives for manufacturing, so value-added activities that can be done there. Uh, uh, new ones in private equity funds that I'll talk to you more about. And renewable energy, so there's a whole suite, a whole package of incentives to support new economic activity that's focusing Puerto Rico outside into the world. I spoke to you this, about this already. So in this, in this world of climate change, we, we, you know, Dr. Cook was talking about the choices that firms have to do as far as location. We have to place bets. We have to place bets as far as where, where are we gonna produce in a world of uh, no water, in a world of instability too, and security. Uh, and I think Puerto Rico, once again, stands at, as that $100 bill and the pair of jeans coming out of the dryer. It, it could change the game, at least for the Eastern Seaboard uh, receivers, there could be a play, not just in produce, but in other categories. Uh, tropicals and subtropicals, as we've talked about, are uh, naturally grown there, and very few uh, uh, projects have been de designed to, from the scratch, do what the two examples I showed you, Gargiulio and uh, Marktex, to be designed for exporting and conquering the local market. And there's plenty of room for that. This is a, a, a photo of a couple of weeks ago. It's a, it's a new project in um, hydroponics and, 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 sorry, this is, no, this is actually not in hydroponics. This is in, in, in land, but it's of covered agriculture in a greenhouse. It's gonna grow cocktail tomatoes and all the varietals of tomatoes that we are bringing in from as far as Mexico, to give you an example, or Canada. So that's a new project. Interestingly enough, the group behind is not an ag group. It's a financial group that use some uh, clever available techniques within the US system of new market tax credits. Uh, a number of tax credits that are available for uh, projects that have to do with things like agriculture in the US in economically uh, depressed uh, jurisdictions. And much, much of Puerto Rico qualifies for many of the programs that the USDA offers as far as loans, grants, and incentives for developing projects that create um, uh, jobs and economic activity. This is a piece by the, the Agricultural uh, Research Service. It's also present on the island. And there are all these varieties of exotic fruits where we have done all the science research is there of what works. It's all been tried. What's missing are the projects, the people who can come in and take the bets to make this happen. And because we have, not have, uh, uh, we have not pursued agriculture as an industry. One of, one of the things that are needed are uh, entrepreneurs and companies that really understand the business side of this because we do have production specialists, but the business part of agribusiness is much of what we find is missing. So great opportunities if you have insights into your accounts, into your markets of the need for these exotic uh, uh, fruit I think there's a great place to be made in Puerto Rico. And also in organics. As I told you, when we have 74% of our agricultural farmland that is not being used, land, thousands of acres that were involved in sugarcane production and haven't produced anything since 1950, we have a lot of organic soil right now not doing anything. Perfect timing too to exploit that and bring some product up to the States or to Europe with that connection that we have with the shipping. 
So because of all these, uh, what we've uh, decided to do is uh, we partner up. I actually have one of my partners, Alex Porcho. He's, um, I'll t tell you more about him. There's two, two partners and I have, are putting together this investment fund based in Puerto Rico to support the, uh, what we see as the inevitable growth and transformation of our agriculture to the extent that we can leapfrog uh, very old techniques that, that we don't have to go through those anymore and we can go straight to the latest and best uh, methodologies for growing that uh, have all the benefits of making low input uses and, and, and generate the stable production that we're all looking for as, as, uh, as receivers. I'll highlight Alex is uh, uh, very proud. He's a good example of, uh, of what the millennial generation. He's a graduate of MIT uh, as an engineer in both uh, uh, chemical and um, biological engineering. And after working here in New York in the in derivatives tra uh, trading, he went back to MIT because he has a passion for uh, food systems, got his MBA in sustainable food systems, and uh, has been working as a private investor in food startups and has decided to now uh, come back to Puerto Rico in January and uh, start the fund together. So it's part of the example of what is happening under the headlines and what will be a part of the transformation of Puerto Rico and a business that we all understand. And essentially, I want to uh, welcome you to Puerto Rico anytime and come check it out for yourself and see what you could do uh, in there. Okay? Thank you. Um, hi, yes, my name is Kevin Marcheski. Um, I was wondering what... Are you? Oh, okay. sorry. Can you raise your hand? Oh, I'm right over here. Thank you. I was wondering what um, kind of uh, measures you're taking to ensure that the, that the agricultural space in Puerto Rico is protected from natural disasters or climate change? What kind of uh, like specifics? So, the number one, the, all the, the, the climate change maps uh, favor Puerto Rico in terms of, yeah, there's, there's some warming, the ocean level might be coming up, but there's, there's, you know, as far as farmland, it might affect some of the uh, some of uh, saline tables uh, in some part of the low-lying areas. Um, the measures there are actually not there. What are, part of what's interesting is, and we're finding is, that because the sector doesn't have strong stakeholders, I'll give you an example with water use. Um, because we haven't had the big stakeholders uh, consuming water, there is no um, agriculture stakeholder group at the table defining policy for 20, 30 years down the line. Of course, we have an abundant supply of water too, so it's not a concern uh, in that way, but it really does, it should be taken into consideration. So it is part of the opportunities of being in a space that is uh, to be defined, that there's, there, there, there are few evident competitors because the, the activity is not happening yet, right? So when, when, as you start getting scale, then it'll be evident what some of those uh, constraints and tugs of war will be. And I look forward to having those problems. But as far as specific uh, uh, things for climate change, I think in general what we see is a net advantage in the climate change equation as far as available uh, uh, water and, and land. My name is Andreas Schindler. Could you add some more words for the um, mango industry in Puerto Rico? Some season or varieties, ex volumes? Thank you. And the, the, the level of uh, imprecision with which I would give you would be terrible, so I, I would rather uh, take your name. I'll promise to get you that information because I know that we have three uh, significant companies in mango. Martex is the largest, but not the only one. They all export, I believe they all export to Europe, and they all export to the Eastern Seaboard. They are, I, I know from Martex, because I was there a few weeks ago, they are looking to grow. They have no farmland that they acquired, and um, they, they're, they're looking to grow. They can plant for it. The varieties, I have two, three names floating, and I'm, I'm going to tell you the wrong thing, okay? But um, I know that they're, they're sophisticated. You'll find them, they're, they're, they're probably on the small side compared to the, the large production uh, regions of the world, but they're very sophisticated. They're using the, the great techniques and very strong food safety and shipping uh, uh, long distances. So I would love to connect you with them. On production agriculture, I always like to say that we're, we're more like Star Trek than we are like Little House on the Prairie. 
And, uh, you know, we talked about the Peruvian experience a little bit earlier, and really one of the things with Peru is it is large-scale mechanized agriculture on a scale, big international capitals, outside management, world-class technology, big-scale projects. Do you think there is kind of the, the political will in Puerto Rico to per se have a, an agriculture that doesn't look like Little House on the Prairie, Correct. but looks like giant monster factories? Yes, that's, it's a great question. And uh, a lot of the abandonment of agriculture came because of uh, government policies that wanted to uh, keep Little House on the Prairie. And the good, thing is, the good thing is, in my view, is that the results are in and we have no agriculture. So we can keep a museum for Little House of the Prairie, but if we want to actually grow, and now when you reach that outlier, 85%, poor economy, now what I like about crisis is that the good options are actually on the table. You've been buying from Star Trek for a long time. I have. <laughs> So it's a, it's a very good question, and the government has already started amassing. I did not share with you a, for example, uh, 20,000 acres of, uh, for sugar cane production has been amassed by the government to bring a, a, an operator and supply to our rum manufacturers. That's not a little house in the prairie anymore. That's not, so, so the, the thinking is shifting because the results are in, and there's nothing to feel proud about for having pursued small-scale farming. Not that it's inadequate for some place, but certainly the understanding that this is agribusiness and, and the doors are, are opening for that. Thank you. Back there, the microphone. While we're waiting for the microphone to get there, I'd like to ask a question. You mentioned some of the major advantages that come with Puerto Rico being um, uh, Commonwealth in the United mm -hmm. States system, That's right. uh, the banking system, the U.S. currency, but there are some people who would say that there are some uh, difficulties that have been imposed. Uh, for example, we just had some real publicity when one of the few Jones Act ships uh, went under. Um, could you talk a little bit about things that maybe are obstacles to uh, making all this happen? Things like the Jones Act, mm -hmm. minimum wages, those types of issues, and how you think they might be dealt with in the future. Yep. Um, my, 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 problem, my problem is that I, I, I am not seeing them as obstacles, so I'll, I'll be transparent with my bias. Um, for example, the Jones Act. So essentially we are shipping with the most expensive, one of the most expensive per mile uh, shipping explain systems the Jones well. Act. The Jones yeah, Act yeah. Is, a, is a cabotage law that restricts Puerto Rico can only be served uh, by ships that are U.S. flagged, U.S. built, and U.S. crewed. So that, uh, give you an example, we just have a new ship came online last month. It was built in San Diego. Uh, the U.S. shipbuilding industry has not sold a ship to any other country in the last four decades because it's just not competitive. So only military industry or regulated industry ships that have to go down the Mississippi and things like that, they're the only companies that because of that regulation are obligated, if they want to operate, to go order a ship from um, the uh, General Dynamics uh, uh, ship building facility in San Diego. Be beautiful facility, but Really, they haven't sold a ship to anybody outside of the U.S. So, not a competitive supplier of ships, and as a result, we uh, there's a you know shipping is a natural oligopoly in many in many parts of the world. This is not unique, but this one's protected and regulated, and we live with that very expensive freight coming in. So the reason why I don't see it as a as a as a obstacle is I think that is the barrier that makes product. That, that's a problem really for, for uh, growers in the U.S. lose competitiveness because of that system. Uh, so the, so that, the, the, the natural stakeholders sh should be importers and growers in the U.S. To c complaining about that. It's making the link with the mainland more expensive on everything we bring in. But the flip side is that politically, the, the other day we had a, a ship sank and it created a big problem in our supply chain, still is. 
it's it galvanized the politics of it because you went to Costco on a Saturday morning and the shelves were empty. All the all the perishables were empty. Um, Costco did fly in product for a couple of weeks. Yeah, they, were, they were very impressive. But on the most part, so it creates a, a significant problem when people go to buy food and they're used to a very efficient system, and all of a sudden, what do you mean there's no fresh chicken and there's no uh, romaine lettuce today? It's Saturday, and, and all oh, because of the ship. So it really made the political case for the policymakers to do something about it. And the shipping laws are something that every politician who wants to have a common enemy picks on that. But the truth is, I believe it's very difficult to change because it's one of the few policies in which you have US labor unions, US military, and US corporate it's on the same side. So it's very unlikely that we'll change that. But they're very interested, like, like the shipping industry was back in the day that you told a story, they're very interested in filling up those containers going northbound. So I believe that the shipping companies will seek to balance their routes by fostering local production. They already have good pharma business that works well, they have consumer business, they need to balance their route. And, um, and the, the cheap northbound freight, we're talking 25, 20, 20% 20 of the southbound rate, is I think a very a cheap link back to the mainland. What about um, labor costs as opposed to you know, the Dominican Republic or right. an opening Cuba or something like yes. that? Yes, I, I, I think we will be competitive in, um, in more high-tech new models of, of farming that are low on the, on the labor inputs. There's no doubt because no, if we, we, we otherwise are at a disadvantage there. Um, there is discussion right now, the White House has proposed some measures to free Puerto Rico a little bit from the minimum wage, but um, I don't expect that to, just because we liberalize markets doesn't mean that it'll be a race to the bottom. Um, it might just be more flexible for employers and, and employees to, to partner up. So we have to go for niches that, like the ones I think we pointed out, that can provide um, um, organic or low input labor cost uh, production. And they're there and, and, and we can see them. They're, they're right, right in our face. And when you see, when I see Manhattan growing uh, cabbage on the streets, I think we can do a little better than that too. So, right, there was one other question. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Excellent presentation and very informative, sir. So let me just uh, mention that. Um, so you was talking on one of the slides in regarding the uh, the land, uh, a very uh, good percentage if it was available. So I'm just wondering. Puerto Rico is uh, very well known throughout the world for tourism and a lot of the green and the land and you know a lot of that is probably used for that. So I'm just wondering uh, if you're going into the agriculture field or a company wants to move in there and they want to purchase, uh, do they have to purchase the land, do they have to buy it, do they have a certain amount allocated for this kind of projects because I'm sure you just can't go in and say we want to buy land here, there, and whatever. I'm sure there's some kind of governing involved. Can you, do you have any information on that? Uh, yes, some. Um, thank you for your question. The, the land that is already defined as for agriculture can only be used for that, uh, unless there's a zoning change. So, so that, that graph of 74% unused agricultural land, that is land that is already zoned for agriculture and has been for decades. So it doesn't compete with other uses uh, at the moment. Uh, secondly, um, uh, I don't know the numbers of how much is in private hands and how much is in government hands, but there's, there's all sorts of combinations and depends on the municipality. What we're finding as we're taking entrepreneurs that want to start projects uh, you know, with the investment fund, we're taking entrepreneurs into, into different municipalities and the mayors are uh, uh, being very attentive and spending their own personal time driving them around, because for many townships, regard, they, the mayors know where the inventory is in the hands of a family, a person, a government entity, and for them it's very critical, because some of these towns used to be agricultural towns, and to start up economic activity in them means for them to have a thriving municipality. So they're actually collaborating quite a bit and being great salesmen and great hosts of uh, entrepreneurs that want to address that. 
So the answer is there's a variety of conditions and situations, but it is uh, ultimately a, a market, and there are opportunities for leasing land, there are opportunities for buying, for 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 just having permit. Uh, if, if the project is uh, um, promising enough, it could also be uh, given with very cheap concessions from the government to operate on them, because there's a lot of idle agricultural land. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.